Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David, and I am the senior pastor here. And today we are going to start a brand new series. We are going to look at the book of Acts. So we're going to look at the book of Acts because, well, I, we've never done it, right? We've never done it. And I thought probably would be fun just to go back to the start of church, right? How the early church started, what we see the early church doing. Let's go back to basics and rediscover our roots. But first, I think we have to start with the ascension, right? If you're gonna start in Acts and start the very first story, we would be looking at the ascension of Jesus, Jesus going off into heaven. And I think the ascension is such a crucial moment in Jesus' history, but yet it's overshadowed by all the other holidays right? Christmas and Easter, they're great, but Ascension Day is in the month of May, by the way, and it just slips by without a trace, barely recognized, but it's not a small thing. Scottish composer Robert Ramsey said, Easter is complete, Pentecost is impeded, and the second coming is impossible without the Ascension. That means Jesus' Ascension is a climactic, and glorious event. It is his deliverance to the right hand of God the Father. Paul writes in Ephesians, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Jesus comes humbly to earth, right? He descends down to a sin-ruined planet and even went to the cross all for us. And in the ascension story, he is seen returning to glory. Luke, the physician, records that it took place before their very eyes. He wants us to know that something tangible and something real took place. That means there were eyewitnesses to this historical event. It was something unique. It was a spectacular moment. But I think the ascension means that there can also be no new neutrality with Jesus, right? We cannot simply just pick and choose from his teachings. We can't treat him like Socrates or Gandhi or Confucius because the ascension is the, it's the final proof that we are dealing with something that's more than a man. All that the Bible says about Jesus and who he is makes very little sense without the ascension. Through this historical event, we know we're dealing with God. Listen to how the book of Acts begins. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to offer them his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. I don't know that we ever stop and think about the fact that Jesus stays on earth for another 40 days, right? His resurrection, and then 40 days. 40 days is a long time. I mean, if, if Jesus rose today, September 22nd, right? That means we would have his presence until November 1st. So why 40 days? Is there any significance to the number 40? I mean, sure, we see the number 40 all through the Bible. We know that God sent rain for 40 days. When the flood occurred, the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years. When Moses went up to the mountain into the presence of God, he was there for 40 days and nights. The spies were sent for 40 days into the land of Canaan. Goliath taunted the Israelites for 40 days until David shows up. When Elijah ate the food the angel had brought him, it lasted 40 days and nights. Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days. So maybe the number 40 has significance. In the examples I listed, sometimes 40 is a test or it's a time of judgment. And at the end of that number 40, there is blessing and then there's a, a time of rest, right? The flood waters receded. The Israelites went into the promised land. David slew Goliath. Jesus had victory over darkness. Other times, like in the case of Moses and Elijah, the 40 days was a time of 
God's presence and God's power. So what does Jesus do with his 40 days? We see in verse 2, he spent that time giving instructions to the disciples. We see that he made appearances for the purpose of providing, you know, convincing proof that he raised from the dead. Jesus, Jesus appears to many people. 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. So what do we see happen next? While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up into, you, into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. The disciples visibly see Jesus rise off the ground. Jesus clothed now in his new resurrected body. He moves from the material world into the spiritual world. And his followers just look on, stunned. Then two angels appear and tells them that Jesus has gone to heaven. Yes, life will go on for these disciples, but now life is never going to be the, is the same. The ascension of Jesus literally changes everything for them. Have you ever seen Grease, the, the movie, the musical, right, with John Travolta and uh, Olivia Newton-John? There's a few confusing things in the film. I mean, first, Olivia Newton-John is 29 in the movie, and, and, you know, as with most of the other actors, they all kind of look too old to play teenagers. But most of all, why does the car fly off into the clouds at the end? The director said that the main characters had overcome all their issues, and now they, symbolically, they fly above their troubles, everything that had kept them grounded. And others just feel like it's just a, it's a feel-good moment, right? Like, it's like the cowboys that ride off into the sunset. It's a symbol for, from now on, things will be better. Luke records that it was a cloud that takes Jesus off into the sky, perhaps the same cloud that led the Israelites as they wandered in the desert. The cloud reminds us that God's presence is always near, always leading, always directing us. So let's look at a few things we can learn from the ascension. I mean, first, we consider Jesus' majesty. You ever considered what it must have been like for Jesus to return to heaven after his death, burial, and resurrection? John's gospel records a prayer Jesus prayed before he died. Here's what Jesus prayed. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You know, Jesus Christ was born but he was never created, you know? So even before he came to earth, he existed with all the glory of God. And when Jesus came to earth to be with us, he laid aside some of his glory in heaven. But now he prays, when he returns to heaven, when he goes home, he says, I want my glory to return as well. Look at what Paul writes in Ephesians. When he ascended on high, he led a captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. I think what Paul is describing is like a victorious general returning from battle. Here he sees Jesus along with every other Old Testament prophet, and they're forming this royal parade, and through the streets of heaven, this glorious march goes all the way 
to Jesus' throne. King David writes in Psalms, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. I mean, the wrong way to think about it is that Jesus is killed, right? Jesus is defeated. And then he hangs his head in shame and returns home. No. The ascension has Jesus returning home, walking the streets of gold. As angels bow prostrate before him, the glory that had previously belonged to him, all the glory of eternity, it now wraps around him like the robe that a king wears. Jesus' mastery. You know, when Jesus walked the earth, he was pretty easy to find. (laughs) But what about now? Where is Jesus now? The author of Hebrews says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Did you ever wonder where that is? Where is the right hand of God? Because it seems significant, right? It's this place of power. It's this place of superiority. Jesus, who humbled himself like nobody who has ever lived, is now exalted to the place that is above every person who's ever lived. And Paul fleshes this out even further in the book of Ephesians. It says, he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things in subject under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and in all. Jesus is now in his new glorified human body and he now sits on a throne in majesty. We do not worship a defeated teacher. We do not worship a crucified rabbi. We, he was not beaten by the synagogue. He was not stopped by Rome. Jesus Christ has no rival here on earth or in heaven. He is eternally triumphant and he will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. You worship an all-powerful God. You worship an undisputed King of Kings. And so we have a ministry. He has majesty. We have a ministry. You know, I used to believe that people who actually saw Jesus, right, with their own eyes, and they heard him preach, they probably had it the best. They got to see all the miracles. They got to see all the teachings firsthand. But I, you know, I don't believe that anymore. I live in a world right now with Sean Connery and Harrison Ford. And I've never met either of them. I've had chances to see Celine Dion sing. I didn't go. Jesus was here on earth. And that physically limited him. He could only be at one place and at one time. But now, Jesus is your advocate. What's that? Well, the author of Hebrews says, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. If you believe in Jesus, his ministry now is perfected in you. How does he do that? Well, Jesus represents you before the Father. 1 John 2 says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. See, in the ancient world, the advocate was like the, it was like the defense attorney right, who pleads a defendant's case before the judge. And when John calls Jesus our advocate, he means that Jesus stands before the Father to plead our case. Yes, each of us is 
guilty of sin and unable to obtain perfection, but perfect righteousness of Jesus, that righteousness, it sets us free before God. So what is Jesus' continued ministry? Jesus prays for you. Do you ever feel as if life has caved in on you and you just simply don't know what to pray or what to do? Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 8. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yet rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Think about it. Jesus Christ, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, he is praying for you. That's his ministry. It's today. He wants you to be successful. He wants you to finish the race that sets out before you. This is why the writer of Hebrews writes, let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Yes, Jesus does sit on a throne in heaven in majesty. And yes, he may seem physically far away, but now we have access to the Father at all times. We also have Jesus who cares for us and who prays for us, who acts as our advocate. What more could we ask? And now that he has returned to heaven and that he intercedes for us, he has left us with a mission. Jesus told the disciples, repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And then he adds, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You know, sometimes when a loved one leaves you, they might leave some memento as a remembrance, something that, you know, reminds you of them or something that was unique to them. Did you ever wonder what Jesus left us? He left us with a mission. I'm leaving, he says, but in the meantime, be useful. But not just a mission, he also gives us the power to carry out that mission. The gift of the Holy Spirit, that's what made the disciples such useful witnesses. Can you imagine what would have happened to the early church if the Holy Spirit had not shown up? They would have kept on hiding. If the Holy Spirit had not shown up, there would be no church. If the pattern outlined at the end of the Gospels had just continued, the apostles and others, they, they would have maybe never left Jerusalem to be witnesses. They would have maybe formed this religious club called the Jesus Memorial Society, just like other groups. And they would have had meetings and dues and minutes and the usual paraphernalia. And in spite of all their valiant efforts from its members to, we got to keep this organization going, this little band of believers in the risen Christ would have eventually dwindled away. And in time, that memory of Jesus would have erased and just become an interesting footnote in the history of the Middle East. But remember how bold Peter was last week. They weren't afraid of anything. What do you think? Can we be bold and confident when we carry out God's work? We have the Spirit. So what exactly is that work? Good news. Nobody's going to ask you to end world hunger. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask you to create social equality for each living person. Jesus didn't tell us to do those things, did he? No, in fact, he says the poor will always be with you. But the mission he gave us was to share God's word so that people would turn away from sin and that they would find forgiveness in Christ. I'm, I'm really sorry that these past five weeks have been difficult. I wish I could have preached happy things and, and things that we all agree on, but that's not the job I signed up for. It's my responsibility as your pastor to point out your sin and mine, not, not just the sins of everybody else. If I make you feel uncomfortable or guilty during a sermon because I touched on some sin that you're involved in, great. 
That's what you called me to do, to warn you against sin. Of course, it's also my responsibility not to leave you hanging, but to assure you that your sins are made clean in Jesus. And so as you wrestle with your own sin, and as you recognize now that you are also set free, now you are equipped with the knowledge. And now hopefully you get to be a witness to others about this wonderful forgiveness that is available to them. That's what it means to be a witness. The resurrection and the ascension were seen by the apostles. They were there. They saw the power and they couldn't keep it a secret. But now Jesus says you are a witness because you have witnessed God's grace in your own life. Look at how Luke records the ascension in his gospel. When Jesus had led them out of the vicinity of Bethlehem, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Did the disciples return with joy? No. Right? It says, the Bible says, great joy. And then they put that joy on display. They stayed continually at the temple praising God. That means they were out in the open for everyone to see. They weren't hiding anymore. What a difference Jesus' ascension had made in their lives. Can't Jesus' ascension make a difference in our lives? I know you didn't witness it personally, but I know that you can rejoice. Jesus didn't retire. He didn't die. Jesus did not an, uh, ascend to heaven so that he could just kick back at the pool in heaven and, and just watch everything fall apart down here. The ascension was his coronation. The battle with darkness and death that he had been fighting, he won. So today, you and I have witnessed the majesty and the mastery and the ministry of Jesus. So Jesus' work is, is both finished and unfinished. It's finished in the sense that he has done everything necessary for our salvation and nothing can be added to his finished work. But the work of evangelism is unfinished. Our mission is unfinished. Find your joy again. Put a smile on your face again. Lift your hands again. Shout hallelujah again. Invite your neighbors Pray for the lost, share your faith, and praise his holy name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the story of the ascension, that it was witnessed, and that means it's true. Jesus is God. He was God in human flesh, and he walked among us, and he showed us what peace and love looked like, what grace looked like, what forgiveness looked like, what humility looked like. May each one listening to the sound of my voice return to that joy, that first love, and may they go out into the world to be your witness. In the time that we have left, in the world that we have left, let us cast aside all the things that separate and make us different and unite under the banner of the Lamb. No longer is there a left or a right or a red or a blue. There is only the blood of the Lamb. There is only the white of purest snow. Our mission our ministry, our work is to share Jesus Christ, to spread his name, the name above all names, the name above all names. Amen. Thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, I would remind you that we are here. We are here in Montgomery, Texas. We're just off Walden Road. We have a little yellow brick church and we would love 
to have you be a part of our community. We have two services. We have a 930 service, which we call our traditional service. We have a choir. We're gonna sing hymns. We're gonna sing your favorite songs from the 80s and 90s, and it's gonna feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. We have hymnals. We're gonna say the Lord's Prayer. We're gonna do responsive readings. We're gonna share communion together. And then at 11 o'clock, we have our contemporary service. We have a worship team and we have a full program for Bible study, whether you have kids in the nursery or all the way through high school, we even have an adult Bible study. So any type of close, personal, one-on-one -on -one study that you would like to have for you or your family, we have available at 11 alongside our contemporary service. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email the church, call the church, or just stop by. We're here until 3 p.m. and we would love to talk to you. I love you guys and I'll see you next week. Bye.